You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I was joined by Stephen Rainbird. Stephen's research focuses on the political relationship between Spain, Britain, and Portugal in the years before and during the Second World War. Our conversation focuses mostly on the reaction of British political leaders to the events in Spain that led up to the Civil War, and then some of the reasons that the British government chose the path that it did during the conflict. We also discuss the very important matter of piracy in the Mediterranean during the war, where the pirates somehow got a hold of Italian submarines, spoke Italian, and were getting paid by the Italian government. A weird situation, really. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today, I'm joined by PhD researcher Stephen Rainbird, whose research focuses on the relationships between Spain, Portugal, and Britain during the years before and during the Second World War. Stephen, thank you for joining me here today. How's it going? Yeah, very well, thanks. A little dark. But, uh, <laughs> all well. How about you? It's going okay here. Uh, quite chilly today, but I'm working from home due to 2020, and so it's not a problem. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, in the time period before the Spanish Civil War, what was the feeling in London towards the political developments that were happening in Spain? Um, so, I, I think that uh, it's important to give a little bit of background to the British kind of political outlook at the time, um, and to focus a, sort of momentarily on on what was happening in British politics, politics domestically, uh, and then to explain why this uh, sort of affected uh, British political responses to what was going on in, in Spain. So in this period when uh, the second, second Spanish Republic begins, Britain is under the national government. Um, and the national government, which is formed in response to the sort of global uh, depression and crisis uh, that starts in 1929, is nominally a coalition that nominally includes liberals, conservatives and the Labour Party. Um, but in reality, it's an increasingly conservative dominated coalition um, to the extent that really it, it's quite hard to distinguish um, in the years leading up to the Spanish Civil War between what are conservative policies and what are the policies of this nominally national government in Britain. Um, so with this kind of inherent conservatism in power in London, it's kind of straightforward to try and envisage what their um, reaction would be to a left-wing government that is elected uh, by popular vote in the new Second Republic in the early 1930s. Um, so after these uh, elections, um, they are hesitant, I think, in, in the first round of elections in the, the Second Republic. I think that there is a little bit of fear in London that this would spread a kind of um, left-wing chaos or particularly a communist or anarchist chaos. Um, they are in some ways hesitant also toward the uh, government that's formed in 1934. They see them as uh, conservative reactionaries um, and emphasis on reactionary because this is a British conservatism is inherently in some ways quite liberal whereas they see this as a kind of reactionary moment in 1934 and then things really take off in February 1936 and in February 1936 I think that we can see the crystallization of the British institutional 
uh, political response to what's going on in Spain. And they're very fearful. And they're fearful because the Popular Front is elected in Spain and the Popular Front openly contains communists. And what they fear is that this communist uh, kind of insertion into government is actually a Kerensky moment, which is named after Alexander Kerensky, who briefly held power as a kind of interlude before the Bolsheviks took over in Russia. And what they fear is that in Spain, although the communists are a minority in the Popular Front government, that they are, you know, not actually in the cabinet, they're just holding the government up. What they fear is that the communists will poison the Spanish well, and that this is an interlude to communist takeover on the British doorstep. Um, and there's also a fear as well that the socialists in Spain are really not socialists at all. So although the socialists are led by Indalecio Prieto, uh, Lar Largo Caballero is a kind of popular figurehead within the PSOE, the, the Spanish Socialist Party, and he's openly called in the foreign office at the time the Spanish Lenin. So there is this kind of overall fear, both because of the presence of the communists and because of the fear, a fear of the intentions of the more militant wing of the Spanish PSOE, that Spain is entering into a moment of danger in which communist government will arrive at any moment. Um, and this fear is borne out to some degree by reports that are being sent from consular officials who are in Spain who are describing things like popular anti-business measures that are being put into place usually fairly sporadically and indeed spontaneously, uh, but at great enough levels that it begins to worry the hierarchy in London, particularly in the Foreign Office. So with, with that in mind, you know, at the actual moment that events sort of develop in, in Spain in, in later on in 1936 with the, the military rising, uh, what was the initial reaction in the foreign office in what I can only assume was a pretty confusing situation, but maybe not entirely unwanted? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it was a confusing situation. Um, and I think the first thing that I would say is there is a paucity of good information coming out of Spain at that particular moment in time. Um, so the British ambassador is, he, 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 sorry, British ambassador who I personally have, have never really rated as a diplomat, is, has never really sent particularly good information. He's kind of not really there. He's not really telling the foreign office anything. Um, Norman King, who is the consul, the long serving and kind of ill-tempered consul in Barcelona who effectively functions as a number two in some way in the hierarchy of British diplomats in Spain is also not there. So what you've got is in lieu of senior consul and the ambassador, you've got a number of reports coming in from um, councillors and also, you know, honorary officials, um, sort of minor ranking officials, people who usually do the press, people who are not really involved in sending back political reports to London. So you're right to say, yeah, this is an incredibly confusing situation. Um, but I would say that the Foreign Office and the Cabinet and most of Britain has a good general understanding of what's going on and they have a good general view. They understand that there is a uh, right-wing military coup um, against the elected left-wing government. Um, and their reaction to that is fear. Uh, this is how I would in a single word, describe the reaction to events in Spain, in London, fear. And there are two reasons for this, I think. First is the fear of communism or left-wing takeover in Spain. There's a fear that an armed proletariat is going to enact a full-blown social revolution. Um, and what is filtering through from the information that they're getting is in fact, fairly accurate reports that in certain cities, particularly Madrid and Barcelona, the proletariat is being armed to counter this military uprising. And for a conservative British government, arming the proletariat, <laughs> arming ordinary workers on the streets is an anathema. It's a complete anathema to everything that they hold dear about what the fundamental tenets of governance are. Um, and so this is... This is explains this fear, I think, or I think this is the primary driver of this fear, that even though Spain lives 
to a degree on Europe's periphery, it is still definitely in Europe. Um, and there is a general fear, one, that there is going to be armed revolution there, and two, that Moscow somehow is seeding a social revolution, um, not just on, on Europe's far periphery over in Russia, but much, much closer to home in Spain. Um, the second thing, or the second driver that I think is important uh, in explaining why fear is the reaction is that the wider backdrop, of course, for these people, uh, for these men in 1936, is the rise of fascism. And I think what they fear in looking at the military coup uh, and looking at the prospect of a kind of long drawn out civil war is the risk of conflagration um, and the risk that this will be a conflict that doesn't stop in Spanish borders but that um, grows out uh, and takes in some of the more worrying trends of you know the rise of fascism in, in Italy and Germany and perhaps pits Britain and France and the other European democracies against those nascent militaristic fascist powers before Britain really wants or feels able to head to war with them. Um, I think the other thing is that a lot of these policymakers are haunted by memories, by fears of the First World War, um, which is obviously the, you know, the standout explanatory panacea for why they adopt a, a policy of appeasement towards Germany and Italy. Um, and I think that these two things, the risk of conflagration and the, the general tendency towards appeasement amongst the British political elite, um, push Britain to adopting a policy of let's not get involved. Let's just wait and see what happens in Spain. Let's see what the situation um, crystallizes into as thing go, things go on. And then this um, later crystallizes into an official policy. So I think in a kind of quick summary, I would say the British are afraid of contagion um, from the left, contagion from communism, and of tinderbox, uh, a tinderbox moment on the right, a tinderbox that uh, means they have to go to war in order to stop fascism. Um, as the fighting developed and, and it became a full-blown civil war, how important were events in Spain for the leaders of the British government? Did it like instantly become the top item on every agenda? Um, uh, I think that events in Spain um, pushed them to uh, confirm their existing biases. <laughs> I don't think that anything happens in Spain in those initial few weeks that had not really already been decided in London. Um, so what we do get in the summer of 1936, um, in about, from about, say, July um, to September of 1936, is um, fairly patchy information, but information that nonetheless uh, tells them in some ways what they want to hear. So you have descriptions on the ground of anarchy, of social revolution, which motivates their belief that their initial fear was justified and inclines leading minds um, in Britain against the Spanish Republic. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that some of this information is itself uh, not entirely trustworthy. So the ambassador in, in Spain, Henry Chilton, moves to Hende on the French border and actually leaves Spain. So whether or not his reports from Madrid, in a normal sense, are are worthwhile reading is open to debate. Um, and the consul, the long seven consul in Barcelona, Norman King, is on holiday. So <laughs> again, whether his, the report, you know, he, he's not giving that information. And when he returns, his information is so virulently anti-socialist and so virulently anti-left that in some ways it crystallizes and confirms, or it helps to crystallize and confirm British biases. Um, and so what I would say is this, that the information that they send in August is deeply unfavorable to the Spanish Republic, and it contributes to a fear of the Spanish Republic. Um, but I would not say that anything that's sent from on the ground in Spain changes British policy. It simply reinforces the existing biases that led them to make those decisions in the first place 
in July, right, right at the outbreak of the war. Um, I would also say, I would also focus a little bit um, on economic interests. And uh, for a long time, there has been a view, especially in British historiography or amongst British historians, that economic interests were the major factor in explaining why Britain decided to uh, basically do nothing and, there, and therefore to uh, facilitate a Francoist victory. Um, it's not actually clear in the documentary evidence that we have available that all British companies were willing on a Francoist victory. Um, what is clear is that certain large companies were, for example, Rio Tinto, who were a large British mining conglomerate who operated in the south of Spain, were very keen to press the government uh, to recognize the Francoists quickly in order to secure what they saw as both political advantage with the eventual victors, but also to do away with the harmful and burdensome reforms of the left-wing or left-leaning Spanish Republic. But most other large companies, British companies operating in Spain, um, were much more ambivalent. And what they really wanted to do was, to, uh, much like the government, to realise a policy of wait and see. So the Bank of London and South America, which was a fairly large British bank operating in Spain, basically had no communications with the British government. They didn't want to incline them one way or another. The British insurers, of whom there were about 15 operating in Spain at the time, uh, were obviously absolutely terrified by the conflict because they were terrified that they were going to have to pay out on all these policies that they'd loosely underwritten in the uh, period of the Second Republic. But again, although they formed their own specialist committee, the Spanish Emergency Committee, that committee put no pressure at all on the British government in those initial months of fighting in 1936. They prefer to deal with things internally and to pursue cooperation with other European insurers, including the Italians and the Germans, rather than to push their weight onto the British government to uh, incline one way or another in the conflict. Um, the other thing is that the failure of the Francoist rebels to capture their key objectives incentivizes non-intervention. The British see pretty quickly, this is only a partially successful coup, or to put it another way, a partially successful coup is a failed coup. They have taken some of Spanish territory, they've taken about a third of Spanish territory very quickly, but they have not achieved their stated aims. Madrid, Barcelona, Bilbao and Valencia, which are about the four serious cities, in industrial cities in Spain, have all not been captured. They all remain under the legitimate control of the Spanish Republic. Um, and this incentivizes non-intervention because it, 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 it shows the government actually, or it, it leads the British government to think, actually, if we get involved here, are we wandering into a quagmire? This would have been much easier in some ways if the Francoists had just stormed across Spain and captured everything and these cities had fallen. But instead, what we're watching is a coup that has been not successful in its initial aims. Why should we now get involved? Um, and this is confirmed by September, uh, by developments in, in the war in September. So by then, the nationalists or the Francoists have a corridor that stretches from parts of Andalusia through to Galicia in the north, through uh, the northern part of Castilla. Uh, and their furthest extension east is in Teruel in Aragon, in addition to Ibiza in Mallorca. But all the rest of the country is out of their hands. And this cements the view in London, this is a war of attrition. And the view that this will be a serious war of attrition that will not be won quickly leads them to say it is best for us to stay out of it at all costs. So, so uh, you mentioned there a lot about why they stayed out or why they settled into this non-interventionist policy. Uh, were there groups within the government that were instead pushing to, to be more actively involved? From, from this kind of policy, uh, from British uh, initial reactions that this is going to be a quagmire, there's going to be a war of attrition that they don't necessarily got, want to get involved in, this crystallizes into a stated policy of non-intervention. Um, and 
in order to understand um, what we might call institutionalized non-intervention and the creation of the non-intervention committee in Spain, we kind of have to bring France into the interview for a moment. Um, and to understand the interplay between France and Britain in the summer and early autumn of 1936. Um, so France is at the time under quite a different government. Uh, they're under the left-wing socialist government of Leon Blum. And Blum initially, um, uh, pressured by his party, but also motivated by his own beliefs that the left-wing Republican Spain is its sister, so led by its sister socialist party and is an, a manifestation of the democratic will of the people, um, supports the Republic and supports the selling of arms to the Republic in order to defend itself from what is a military coup uh, and against the side that has the lion's share of the manpower, organized manpower and military hardware. Um, and Bloom is torpedoed by a combination of his own party, French socialists saying this isn't anything to do with us and we should not get involved in what's going on in Spain. And at the same time, is strongly pressured uh, through British diplomacy in August 1936, saying, you do not know what you are getting yourself into. Stop now and save yourself. Um, you are an ally of the British, and the British don't want anything to do with this. Um, and so this, so you have to see first that the French were involved intimately in, in non-intervention uh, right from the beginning. Um, on the British side of things, uh, it might be useful to talk a little bit about the balance of power in the cabinet and um, the kind of political makeup and differing views of the cabinet. So this is a cabinet of men who would love to be foreign secretary, uh, of men who have been foreign secretary, and of one man who is currently the foreign secretary. Um, and this is a kind of common refrain in British politics, that everyone wants to be foreign secretary, that this is really the sexy brief, that this is the great office of state in a nation that has traditionally conceived of itself as a, a great overseas power. Um, I can't remember who it was that said the quote, but they said basically in any given cabinet, you have 20 men who want to be foreign secretary. And at no point is this truer than the interwar period where questions of foreign policy are both the question du jour and also a kind of existential life or death question about what it is that Britain does and Britain's place in the world. Um, so in the cabinet, you have Anthony Eden, who is the actual foreign secretary. You have Samuel Hoare, who is the first Lord of the Admiralty, who is a former foreign secretary. You have Ramsay MacDonald, who is the Lord President, who was once leader of the Labour Party, who desperately wants to be foreign secretary. Then you have Stanley Baldwin as prime minister, who has a natural oversight over foreign policy as prime minister. And you have Viscount Halifax as Lord Privy Seal, who also desperately wants to be for the, the foreign secretary. Um, so in August, Eden, in fact, goes on holiday and Halifax is his really aggressive deputy. Um, and to bring in a slightly personal element to this as well, Halifax is a strong Anglo-Catholic. He is an Anglican, but of distinct Oxford movement, Tractarian identity. He identifies probably as a Catholic first, and an Anglican second. Um, and this inclines him naturally against a Spanish Republic that has one of its stated aims as anti-clericalism. And it inclines him towards a revolution that frames its uh, stated aims, however disingenuously, as a crusade for the Catholic nature of Spain. Um, so you have him as the kind of chief, I suppose, uh, ideas man behind British policy in, in, in Spain. Uh, and also at this time, it, he is backed up by a foreign office that is unduly important because a number of ministers are on the holiday and it's the parliamentary recess. So there are no MPs to kind of be able to pressure in a public forum in the usual channels British policy. Um, and in the foreign office, there's a, a sort of number of things going on with personnel that all relate to it being August and this being the traditional time to go on holiday. So the permanent undersecretary, Robert Vance Tart, he is strongly anti-dictorial, anti uh, but again, he is on holiday in Berlin. Um, and Sir Alexander Kadoan, who had been in Peking, now Beijing, uh, is kind of there lurking in the shadows, wanting Vansittart's job, trying to do Vansittart's job, 
um, because he's been recalled to become, in effect, the permanent undersecretary. So between Alexander Karouan and Halifax, you have a diumvirate of the almost men in British foreign affairs, and they strongly opt for a policy of non-intervention. And between them, I would say, because of who is in control of the Foreign Office at this particular moment in August 1936, which is Caduan and Halifax, you have two men who are strongly personally inclined against the Republic, even more so than other establishment figures in the United Kingdom, and who are strongly inclined towards a policy of non-intervention. And this crystallizes along by it's it's important to say here that it there is debate still over whether institutionalized non-intervention was a french idea or a british idea i would say this and this is probably not an answer that will please many people it almost doesn't matter whether it was a french idea or a british idea it's all it, it, you know it's, we shouldn't get too het up on who said it first? You know, what, what, what came first, the French chicken or the British egg? It doesn't matter. By August 1936, or the end of August 1936, both the French and the British are happy and want, or not happy, but are contented with institutionalised non-intervention as the best course of policy action in Spain. <laughs> Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. So after these discussions occur between Britain and France, they decide on this non-intervention policy, but it becomes pretty clear that the Germans and Italians are not, not going to go along with that. Um, <laughs> they're in the game, I guess. And so with clear indication that German and Italian troops are in Spain, was there any movement towards intervention in London? Did, did that change the equation at all in their mind? I think that this, the fact that Germany and Italy are um, committing wide-scale um, outrages against the formalized non-intervention pact, uh, a committee of which they are both members, uh, is the most farcical facet of British policy towards Spain in the Civil War. It is absolutely ludicrous, even by contemporary standards, even without the enormous condescension of prosperity that British policymakers can see very crystally clear that Italy and Germany are sending men and money and goods and, above all, firepower to Spain in order to crush the Republic. And it changes absolutely nothing in London. And they deliberately opt to do nothing. It is entirely widely known in Cabinet, in the Foreign Office, by the man on the streets in Britain, 
that Germany and Italy are helping the Francoists, that they are funneling them with the cutting edge of military supplies in order to crush the, the Republic. Um, and particularly the Italians. At the peak of Italian intervention in Spain, there are 70,000 Italians in Spain. It's not like there are 10 or 20 men who might have come in under assumed identities or rafted in over the Mediterranean in the dead of night. There are 70,000 of them. It is blindingly obvious that Mussolini is doing everything he can to support a Francoist victory. Um, And most of these men were there, or a a great number of these men arrived there before non-intervention was even crystallized. So it's, it's been farcical right from the word go. And even though it increases greatly in volume, it, it, it's, it's always been in the British policy, it seems to kind of ignore um, Italian and German intervention. Um, and it's worth kind of detailing, I think, the extent as well of this kind of Italian and German widespread intervention in Spain. Um, now, the most notorious, in some ways, act is in April 1937, um, when the Germans bomb the Basque market town of Guernica. Um, and although there is a kind of Francoist and right-wing apologist attempt to say that, you know, that the people in Guernica blew themselves up or that it had been exaggerated, that it was to, um, borrow a term that is currently in much use, fake news, it was well known that the nationalists had, were behind this. And it was well known that it was the Germans themselves who carried out what was literally a mass terror bombing designed to do nothing other than take civilian life to bomb the Basques into submission. Um, And nothing is done. In July 1937, there is just a a failure to reach international agreement because the Italians and the Germans just constantly protest that they have nothing to do with it. Um, And in July 1937, after this out, you know, the, the literal outrage of the killing of innocent civilians in April 1937, the Italians begin unrestricted submarine warfare against the Republican Navy in August, um, which again is completely against the the spirit of non-intervention. And the British at this point do something curious, which is they act. They say, right, there's submarine bombing um, against the Republican uh, Navy and we've got to do something about it. but they act in the most farcical manner possible. So they have the Nyon Conference, and it says pirates are behind submarine warfare. Now, how on earth in the 1930s, bands of pirates would have come across fully armed operational submarines, which they had the know-how to operate effectively in the Mediterranean, I have no idea. I have no idea how such a thing would have been possible. And yet this was the official finding of a conference in which the British government was taking place. Those are some pretty good pirates. These are amazing pirates. We have long moved on from, you know, I mean, you think about pirates, you you kind of think like 17th, 18th century, just the big sails taking like Dutch tea traders and the Dutch East Indies. Oh no, their ancestors have really learned a thing or two about piloting submarines um yeah these are the most advanced pirates in the world right um and so they have the noun conference and they say it's pirates which is just the most ridiculous imaginable finding um and they agree to set up naval patrols against pirates and what the effect of these naval patrols is that german and italian warships and submarines are institutionally allowed access to spanish waters in order to patrol for pirates they have to they patrol for the, themselves. Yeah, they are the pirates. <laughs> it, it, oh, so it, it'd be the equivalent in the 1800s of saying to the pirates, listen, we're worried about pirates. Can you patrol for pirates? I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, so it's the kind of diplomatic pomp and circumstance for the preservation of the status quo, which is really designed to save British face rather than actually to move the diplomatic British needle. Um, And I think that this is really important. And and, um, the, 
even as it becomes obvious that the Germans and the Italians are making a, an absolute tragic mockery of non-intervention, the British don't move. In fact, the closest that they might come to abandoning non-intervention is in about late 1937, where they say, well, mightn't we as well give it up? That way Germany and Italy can just act more freely and we can call German and Italian intervention by its name. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. And I think that at the same time, although people kind of, although the needle starts to move in people's minds in, in about late 1937, what you also have is um, certain holdouts who foreshadow the attitude to Spain in the 1950s, which is thus, uh, communism is what we should actually be afraid of in Spain. Um, and so you have figures like Owen St. Clair O'Malley, who was a former head of the Southern Department, in, or sorry, who at the time is the head of the Southern Department in the Foreign Office. And he just says it explicitly in 1937. He says, I had thought it was generally admitted, the Non-Intervention Com Committee, to largely be a piece of humbug. Where humbug is the alternative to war, it is impossible to place too high a value upon it. So, and I think that this is a nice encapsulation of what the British, or what a number of British officials are thinking in 1937, that we know Italy and Germany are intervening. We know that these pirates aren't Blackbeard's incredibly technically gifted descendants, that they are themselves the Germans and the Italians. We know they're committing men. We know they're committing atrocities. Um, we, know they're giving, we know they're giving large amounts of financial and military aid. And it is still preferable to us allowing communism or conflagration in Spain. So as the civil war approaches its conclusion, is there a reevaluation in, in Britain about this path, you know, as uh, things go quite poorly for the Republic and sort of also, you know, events are developing elsewhere in Europe by that time, or were they just, you know, happy, okay, it's over, let's move on. We've got bigger problems literally at this point. Yeah, I think it's more the former than the latter. I think in about, um, I think in about 1938, this is when you can really perceive that doubt and regret are starting to creep into the minds of kind of several leading British thinkers. Um, and I think that it is a sense of regret. The cure for the leftist republic is the quasi-fascist Franco. Um, and the cure may in fact be worse than the disease. And you're right, this is linked to the changing European situation. Fascism is growing as the major threat relative to communism. Fascism has exceeded its borders already and threatens to exceed more borders, whereas communism has largely remained in Russia. And as the fear of fascism grows and as a slow turn toward appeasement begins to take hold in the British establishment, people begin to look very nervously at the axes having a foothold in Spain because Franco being in charge there, being friendly to Germany and Italy or himself joining that club is a massive threat to Gibraltar and by extension to British access to the Mediterranean uh, through which eventually passes shipping to the Far East. So there is a fear that, in fact, what they have done is to allow a strategic situation to occur in which they may not be able to access the Mediterranean and, and may have extreme difficulty keeping Gibraltar and therefore uh, controlling shipments through the, the Mediterranean. Um, and I think that in addition to this purely strategic um, consideration of the Axis threat, there is also a turn toward an abhorrence of fascism and a vitriolic turn against, or a turn against appeasement that will eventually become significantly more vitriolic. Um, so, and I think that this is encapsulated or capped off by um, Guilty Men, which was written under the pseudonym Cato in 1940. Um, which is written by, I think, Michael Foote, Frank Owen, and the journalist Peter Howard. Um, and what you see in this book is a kind of 
diatribe against people who had opted for appeasement of the fascist powers in these war periods. Interestingly enough, it doesn't actually say anything about Spain. It, it doesn't mention anything about the Spanish Civil War. But I think it's worth mentioning because it didn't come out of the blue in 1940. There were the precedents of it as early as 1938. And I think that in Spain, people could point to a case study where they would say, actually, supporting the quasi-fascists here was a strategic, uh, political and moral mistake from our viewpoint. We, we should have done more to try and stop fascism from spreading over the continent. Um, the most interesting case, I think, in understanding how uh, these British attitudes shift between 1937 and 1938 is the case of John Leach, um, who was the British Chargé d'Affaires and later ambassador to Spain in 1937 and 1938. And um, when he first arrives, he comes to Spain and he says, I have arrived in a, a lunatic asylum. Um, he, he says it's been taken over by Trotskyists and anarchists and communists. They are living under the miserable socialist, communist, anarchist red flag. It is total chaos. There are uncontrolled killings. The government is completely useless. We are watching the social revolution in the flesh and it is to be abhorred. Um, and I think this is April 1937 that he arrives. And by the time that he leaves in October 1938, he is so violently anti-Franco that the Foreign Office have grown tired of reading his reports because he is constantly writing to them, de detailing in, in sometimes quite upsetting detail um, the outrages against common decency, against liberal democracy, against the rights of man that the Francoists have committed. Um, and he says Franco is going to have this pyrrhic victory over a heap of ruins, that we have doomed ourselves by adopting a policy of non-intervention in Spain that de facto favours the, the Francoist rebels. And I think that this is so interesting. Jill Edwards calls it an almost Pauline conversion that he goes from being Saul on, on the road to Damascus and leaves as, as Paul spreading the gospels of, of the Spanish Republic in, in late 1938, um, that he encapsulates so much this turnaround of certain British thinkers. And he's a particularly extreme case because he's rabidly anti-Republican when he arrives and extremely pro-nationalist by the time he leaves. But I think that you can discern a similar kind of pattern of a turn away from the Francoists towards a recognition that they are not the um, panacea that the British had hoped for, for um, peaceful government in Spain, that the Republic, that perhaps they should have adopted a policy that was um, slightly more capricious to the Republic's interests. Um, Churchill in particular undergoes this transformation, much like Leach, although to a slightly lesser degree, he begins with relatively pro-Francoist views and comes over to a more pro-Republican view as time goes on. Um, but also Eden, uh, Anton Eden, I think, becomes gradually uh, inclined toward the idea that backing, Frank backing Franco was not the, the policy decision that should have been made. And even Halifax himself comes to see that actually Francoist rule um, is perhaps not what he thought it would be uh, and perhaps is, is, is actually uh, runs contrary to one, his own sort of moral views, but two, also to British interests. So a lot of our conversations today about the, the British and their reactions to events in Spain um, are kind of concerned about political or secondary effects, but uh, you've also done research on Portugal as well, and it's uh, right next door. Uh, so what was the official stance of the Portuguese government? And was there danger of the war spilling across the border? Yeah, Portugal's really interesting. Um, the way that I describe Portugal and Spain's uh, relationship to one another is from an El País article in, I think, about 1999. They described them as Siamese twins joined at the back. <laughs> I just think is great. It makes me, it, it really just encapsulates so perfectly 
Um, two countries whose destinies are kind of inexorably entwined, but who largely never face one another and have nothing to do with one another's lives. Um, so, firstly, a little bit of political background in Portugal. Uh, it's under the rule of the authoritarian, conservative, but not necessarily fascist dictator, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, and he's a Stel Novo, or New State. Um, and the new state has risen gradually. It has its origins in a 1936, uh, uh, sorry, 1926 coup, which replaces the sort of liberal but chaotic first Portuguese Republic, um, and is crystallized as a regime in which Salazar has an unnerving, a frankly unnerving amount of control in about 1932 or 1933. This is the year where we can really start talking about Nistel Novo as a cohesive political unit. Um, and because of the Republic's um, left-leaning sympathies and also because Salazar himself abhors democracy, um, the Portuguese always have a particularly negative attitude toward the Spanish Republic. Even in the two years where it is run by the right-wing side of Spanish politics under Fira, um, the Spain is a, a harbour for refugee, political refugees who are in exile from the Portuguese regime, and this is a particular sore spot for Salazar um, because he is very afraid of political plotting that might be going on in Spain. And then in February 1936, when this avowedly left-wing um, and communist-involved uh, government comes to power in, in, in Madrid, the reaction in, in Lisbon, you can well imagine, is pretty negative. Um, and so he is, he, he is basically extremely anti-republic because he's virulently opposed to both communism and particularly to atheism. This is a man who entered a Catholic seminary before he decided to become uh, a, a law professor. So he is genuine, in, 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 in contrast to Franco, who always wears the moral side of his faith pretty lightly. Salazar is a genuinely committed Catholic. Um, and so when this uprising occurs, Salazar thinks, oh, that's fantastic. Well, he doesn't actually think that's fantastic, but it, it's clear to him that this is preferable to the atheistic anarchy of the Republic, that the militaristic authoritarianism with Catholic influences is better than a regime that he explicitly hated. Um, and so there is huge press coverage given to this rebel uprising. There is absolutely massive amounts of press noise in Portugal's, uh, there's particularly newsreels, but also uh, newspapers, radio reports about the uprising in Spain and, and how it's for the best. Um, and they, the regime also sends over the Viriatos, who are a kind of semi-official force of Portuguese volunteers who fight under the Portuguese flag and who are certainly not discouraged by the regime. Um, uh, although estimates wa v sort of vary wildly for how many there were, there were possibly 3,000 upper estimates, but at 20,000, there were probably about eight to 12,000, which is, is large, is substantial, but not uh, a major force in the war. There are probably about maybe a maximum of 5,000 at any one time. What Portugal does do from a material point of view, uh, no, let me rephrase that. From a material point of view, uh, Salazar is a great ally of the Francoist uprising. And it's interesting because Franco's brother, Nicolas Franco, his older brother, becomes the de facto ambassador to Portugal. He's sent in the very first weeks of this war to go and stay in a plush hotel in Lisbon and to try and extract every benefit that he possibly can from Lisbon. Um, and this is actually what the primary use of Portugal is for Spanish because Portugal, Portugal really becomes a conduit by which they can buy arms on the international market, which can then be smuggled over to the border into Spain. Now, even though there is nominally a ban on the Spanish rebels purchasing arms, 
There is, of course, no ban on Portuguese companies operating freely on the international market from buying arms for themselves. Now, of course, they're buying ridiculous amounts of arms uh, for unstated reasons. That they just so happen up... to disappear. Oops. Yeah, yeah well, why could you possibly want, you know, these 10,000 pistols? Well, just in case of burglars. Um, yeah, exactly this, this, this kind of pretense. But this is what Salazar is useful for. He is a, a, it, there's a kind of official way for the Spanish rebels to get things through to them across into Spain. And this is also, you, you know, it, it's important to remember that territorially, what the rebels take first of all is Galicia to the north, which in, shares a mutually intelligible language with Portugal, and then Paso de Lucia, and then they run up their corridor across the port- against the Portuguese border. So anything can go over that border pretty easily. Um, and I think that the support offered very um, obviously by the Estado Novos Press and the material support that was given by Salazar's acceptance that things were going to be taken over the border has led some people to say that Salazar was the great ally of Franco. I would actually um, caution against adopting this view. Um, firstly, Salazar is, is pretty um, neutral toward Franco himself. Now, it's important to understand that these are very different men. Um, Salazar is an incredibly repressive dictator uh, whose regime does become like intolerably crushing later on in life. But he's also an extremely smart intellectual. He has a PhD. He went to Coimbra, which is the Oxford of um, Portugal. He speaks uh, fluent French fluent Latin. Um, He probably understands Spanish um, and can read some English. He is a professor of economics and he is genuinely committed to the Catholic faith. And he is also extremely ambivalent towards his own military. Although nominally he is the prime minister and the president of Portugal is Oscar Carmona, who is a general, he is actually deeply fearful of the Portuguese military. He keeps them at arm's length. He is fearful that at any moment the military could kind of turn against his regime. He doesn't like militaristic men. He is not a fan of Hitler in any any sense. Um, and he looks at Francisco Franco as this kind of comically stupid figure. Like, and and this is not like completely ridiculous. Franco's primary talent is playing off the two groups in his regime, which is the fascist militarist diarchy, uh, in order to consolidate his own power. But beyond that, he, has, he is basically an unserious, you know, almost like comically uh, stupid, unintelligent man. Um, so he has this kind of personal, I think, aversion to Franco when he emerges as the figurehead. Um, and I think he also, Salazar, fears the outcome of a strongly of a civil war that would create a strongly militaristic regime in in Spain because there are certain groups particularly the Falange who have this kind of revanchist idea or interest in in taking over Lisbon um sometimes they uh, so for example in the civil war uh the nationalists call Lisbon the the, the port of Castilla and this is a double edged sword Because on the one hand, it shows that Portugal is very useful for funneling goods into helping the uprising. But at the same time, it demonstrates this kind of latent nationalist, Spanish nationalist belief that Portugal is really a part of Spain, that Lisbon is really a province of Castilla, that they, there are these kind of pretensions over Portugal. Um, And just to, you know, just to give credence to this, although this is much later, in 1940, Serrano Sunier, who is uh, Franco's brother-in-law and is kind of the powerful man in the regime at this time, um, looks at a map of Europe and says, well, geographically speaking, Portugal really has no right to exist. So I think that this is, um, I think it's interesting to remember this, that, 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 Salazar is is very aware of this. 
he fears that a very militaristic fascist falangist Spain would have pretensions over Portuguese independence. Um, and although Portugal loves to say that it is not a small country, there's this fantastic poster of all of the Portuguese colonies superimposed over Europe with the title, Portugal now é um país pequeno, Portugal is not a small country. It is, of course, a small country protected by the smallest of militaries um, that would literally be unable to resist encroachment by a seriously organized Spanish army, particularly with Italian or German support. Um, and the, all this contributes to the fact that Salazar doesn't recognize the Francoist regime until late 1938. Now, of course, this is relatively early compared to, say, the French and British democracies. But in some ways, given that Franco is like him, an authoritarian Iberian dictator, and given his stated hatred of the Spanish Republic, you would think that recognizing these people as the legitimate government would be one of the very first things that he would do. Um, and so I think in, in some, I would describe Salazar's attitude to the Spanish Francoists thus. It's collaborative ambivalence or ambivalent collaboration. He is prepared to help them both officially and unofficially, but from the very beginning, he fears the consequences of this military uprising and a potential uh, Francoist rule in Spain for the independence and the future of Portugal. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and doing this interview. It has been uh, fantastic. Oh, no, thank you. Very kind of you to have me, Wesley. And uh, it's been a fantastic interview. So, so thanks very much, really. Thank you.